May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Tough act to follow, these kids sometimes. So cool and profound to hear a child's voice speak the words of God sometimes. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure how it happened, but last spring, summer, um, in our household, we ended up raising a number of butterflies. And I mean, it was definitely more than 20, but less than 100, like somewhere in there, I kind of lost track, you know? <laughs> Carrie had a friend at work who um, had a habit of going up to like Northside Park and finding them and bringing them back, and she had too many to do on her own, and so we ended up with them. And, and of course, butterflies have this amazing life cycle, right? They're this tiny little egg, which becomes a caterpillar, which then goes into a chrysalis or a pupa, and eventually, all things going right, breaks out into a butterfly. One of the things I learned is that caterpillars eat a lot of food, right? We had to constantly be giving them milkweed because their bodies are going through so much growing they needed to be nourished. And then when that time comes and the chrysalis forms, you don't exactly see what's happening inside, of course. And it's not until later that you see the fullness of the transformation. And, and it's a messy process. In fact, when the butterfly breaks open from the chrysalis, a lot of times you see a red kind of liquid. It looks a little bit like blood, um, but it's actually not, I've learned. It's, it's a kind of mixture of waste elements um, that developed in the process of its change. Right? So this, this movement from caterpillar to butterfly, which when you hold those two things side by side is remarkable enough Right? It's even more remarkable when you think about everything that had to happen in the middle and the costs involved and the work involved in that. And so you might be thinking to yourself, well, we're in church, why are we talking about butterflies? Right? A natural question. Um, but as you can see, um, there's a picture of a butterfly there and you have one in your insert as an insert and one in the bulletins for a reason. When we have this habit of talking about our church windows, we focus mostly on windows in the church, this part of our um, sacred space. And each of these windows, of course, is uh, directly linked to a story in Scripture. Um, this is actually a part of the chapel. This is a window that you can find if you go to the original church building just on the other side of our campus. And if you went in there, you'd find it. Um, it's actually a little smaller than that one. Um, but if you look at your picture, one of the things I love about this window which is just so interesting about how these things happen, right? There's no way I think you could have planned it exactly like this. You can see how faded, though, that some of the decorative stuff along the edges are. That's not about the printing. That's actually what it looks like. And then this window just looks like stark, like, like it was just done, the butterfly portion. Um, but much of the rest of it um, doesn't. And, of course, for Christians, the reason butterflies are a symbol you'd find on a stained glass window is because it's a symbol of change, profound and real change. And for us, of course, the, the place that most naturally fits into our conversations about our faith is resurrection, right? It's an Easter symbol, a symbol of helping us imagine the kinds of ways we're making sense of Jesus before his death and resurrection and Jesus after and, and for us, the reason we're looking at it today is the transfiguration is kind of a precursor to that, right? A glimpse into that thing which will happen in the resurrection. The story we heard today is about transformation, profound change. Christ being transfigured before Peter, James, and John. It's a moment when they catch a glimpse of the fullness of his identity. Now, prior to this moment on the mountain, Jesus had been traveling around teaching and performing miracles. Of late, he'd even been foretelling his own death and resurrection. But the disciples couldn't really bring themselves to believe what he was saying. And there's that little phrase at the beginning that sort of says, after six days, they went up the mountain. In those six days, what had actually just happened was Peter had proclaimed Jesus as Messiah on the one hand. And on the other hand, when Jesus started talking about his death and resurrection, Peter said, this can't be true. And Jesus starts to, you know, calls him Satan, get behind me, right? So this is all the stuff that leads up to them moving up that mountain on that day. And for some unknown reason, we don't know why, Jesus decided this was a good day to climb what's called a high mountain. And rather than go alone, he takes Peter and James and John with him. 
And the Gospel of Matthew then tells us at some point on their journey, Jesus was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became dazzling white. And suddenly, there appeared Moses and Elijah talking with him. In that moment, something about Jesus' identity was being revealed to the disciples. It was a moment that reaffirmed Peter's proclamation that Jesus is indeed Messiah. Think about it. Not only are we told His face shone like the sun and His clothes dazzled white, but He was joined by two of the most important and sacred figures of the Hebrew Scriptures, standing in continuity with them. But who was the one who shone? Who was the one of primary importance? Christ. And so Jesus is linked with those great prophets and sacred leaders who came before. And that day, Peter and James and John got this glimpse into the divine. They got to see the butterfly, in a way, even before it broke out of its chrysalis. And as Christ's identity is revealed, we're told how Peter responds. He wants to build a dwelling for Moses and Elijah and Jesus. And this sounds a bit odd to most of us, I think. Right? Like, why would you want to all of a sudden build houses on this high mountain? But I think really what's happening here is Peter's trying to honor the sacredness of the moment. He knows that what happened is so important, he wants to grasp onto it and be able to remember it and come back to it. So, what Peter was doing is really understandable. But before he can even finish his thought, a voice from heaven booms in and interjects, right? This is my son, the beloved, with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And after hearing that voice from heaven, I think the disciples respond in a perfectly reasonable way. We saw our children do it, right? They fall to the ground in fear and awe, unsure what to make of this remarkable thing happening before them. Now here's the quiz. Do you remember the last time we heard a voice from heaven speaking essentially those very same words? Anyone? The baptism. Exactly right. The baptism of our Lord Jesus, which was the beginning of the season after Epiphany, right? The first week of the season we're in now, we celebrated the baptism of Jesus. And those very same words came from heaven. And now we are at the last week in the season of Epiphany, after Epiphany, and those words are spoken again in a different place with one important addition, right? This time, the voice from heaven adds, listen to him. Listen to him. Jesus is transformed. And so too are we if we listen to him. That's where following Jesus begins. With that act of paying attention. And if we want to live into the fullness of our baptismal identity, it begins there. The journey of baptism and the moment of transfiguration are about a lifetime of things and moments where we choose to listen and follow. And notice as the disciples experience the fear of that moment when the voice spoke, as they cower in awe, unsure of how to respond, what does Jesus do? He goes to them, touches them, and he says, get up and do not be afraid. In the midst of their fear, he doesn't get angry or upset that they don't exactly understand what's happening. In the midst of their fear, what he does is stay in relationship with them. In the midst of their fear, he gives them the strength to stand up once more for a journey not yet done. Reminding them they don't have to travel alone in this moment and they don't have to be afraid because he will be with them. A promise about being with them not just then, but always. Just as he's with us. And so after being given this glimpse of God on the mountain, after having this encounter and Jesus coming to them and inviting them to stand, they do. 
and they head back down into the world they're a part of, the place where they're being called to share the good news which follows from understanding who Jesus is and who they are in and through him. Because I think that moment on the mountaintop only really matters insofar as it allows them to better listen to Jesus so they can, in fact, more faithfully follow where he leads. As the colic reminded us, that so they can carry the crosses which will be theirs to bear as they go through this time of change in them. But as they return, Jesus says this funny thing which we often sort of get caught on. He says, tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. And so we naturally wonder, what is that about? Why the secrecy? Why not let them speak about that moment? And as I thought about butterflies, I wondered if it was because Jesus knew the deep truth of that moment could only be understood after the resurrection. Unless you had the experience of being there with him, it was a story you couldn't quite make sense of. It, it would be like trying to tell somebody who had no experience of caterpillars and butterflies, showing them the caterpillar and telling them this is going to become something with delicate wings and vibrant colors that's going to fly away. Right? It's hard when you know that that's already true to imagine what that experience would be like. But it's hard to fathom that that could be possible. But we know. Eventually they did tell the story to a world that was ready, that craved to hear it. And more importantly, they didn't just tell the story. They listened to what Jesus said before and after. They followed him. They strove to be people of love. Even though it all wasn't always easy. In fact, one of the things we know about the disciples is they are far from perfect, as are we. They stumble along the way, as do we. We're not going to get it right all the time. But it's exactly in those moments, in those moments where something goes wrong, where we act in a way we know is not what God would want from us, or when we don't feel good enough or worthy enough, those moments when fear or doubt creeps in, those are the moments we need to remember this story. And the work that's being done in us as God seeks to transform us more and more into His likeness in this life. It's in those moments that we need to remember that Jesus in His glory is for us and working in us. In those moments, we need to remember that the story of that day is not just about Jesus being transformed at all. The story of that day is about the disciples being transformed too. We need to remember that following Jesus begins with that act of listening, leading to that act of living. It's about hearing His invitation and being people who embody the kind of love He dreams for us, so that we might indeed change into the people He dreams for us to be. And the world might be just a little bit more like the kingdom of God. So friends, the story of that day is then about recognizing that we too are meant to be butterflies, changing constantly in this process of growing and evolving, so that eventually, when that time comes, as we move from this life into the next, we burst forth from our chrysalises too. And as we do the hard work of being the good news in the world, it's about hearing Jesus say to us unequivocally, get up. Do not be afraid. Get up. Do not be afraid. For you have everything you need to follow where I lead. Amen.